Great. Um, thanks to Kiran for giving me this opportunity to uh, share some of my ideas about like uh, how to basically be more creative in the computer science classroom. So I'm going to start this session. I better just check my watch here, make sure I don't go over because I have loads of stuff I could um, uh, share with you guys. But I'm going to start off with a mind bomb for you, OK? Uh, the metaverse that can be named is not a me is not the metaverse. So guys, I want you to think about what that sentence means. Uh, and you can just reflect on it right now and write down a couple of notes, right? And uh, what I'm basically doing here is I'm planting a mind bomb in your heads, right? And I'm going to uh, detonate this mind bomb at the end of the talk, right? So uh, what I will say is that you might have heard of uh, Shrek's Onion. Who's heard of Shrek's Onion? Just say in the chat if you've heard of it. Uh, consider Shrek's onion in your uh, explanation of what you think that phrase means. It basically means like there's layers of onion. So you can go deeper and deeper with what that means. Is that okay for everybody? Okay, cool. All right. Uh, where are we going to start here? When I was a little boy, I think we might as well start at the beginning. When I was a little boy, uh, my dad bought me this computer. It's called an MSX. And the MSX computer uh, came with a thing called MSX Basic. And I tried to find a photograph of myself uh, using the MSX computer and I couldn't. So instead, I asked the AI to give me a photograph of uh, me in the 1980s programming on my MSX computer, and it gave me that one. So that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, this is what MSX basic looks like. Um, basically, like, so I had all these like simple primitive things for drawing uh, points and circles, moving things around the screen. And wow, as a little boy, this was like so formative uh, for me, you know? Uh, all of a sudden, I had this amazing capability to make the little people move around the screens by themselves. And my goodness, this was this was so exciting for me. Uh, not only that, but you also had games like Elite in this era. So suddenly, like from an algorithm, you can create an entire universe. And this, as a young boy, was absolutely fascinating to me, having grown up watching movies like 2001 A Space Odyssey and uh, things like Book Rogers and so on. Uh, interestingly, in that era, there was a program called Danny, which I remember typing in from a computer magazine. And Danny stands for Dynamic Artificial Non-Intelligence. And it was, guess what? A chatbot. A chatbot that ran on an 8-bit computer in the 1980s. So suddenly, I could basically sit there and have conversations with my little uh, MSX computer. Again, all of this stuff was very formative in like shaping like how I thought about computer science and uh, teaching and so on. So what else can I say? We're going to fast forward now, uh, 22. We're going to, fa going to fast forward now, what? Like uh, basically 30 years time, 30 years forward into the future. I'm teaching computer science here in, uh, this, in, 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 in well, in, in, in the Grace Gorman campus now. In DIT, uh, prior to uh, prior to TU Dublin, teaching for 22 years. I'm a graduate also of Canvas, but I actually started all the way back in 1990. Um, so I've seen like loads of changes in the computer industry, you know, during this time. And also like been teaching coding all of these years, different kinds of coding and reflecting on, you know, basically like my experiences all the time and trying to basically have the say like a feedback process where I'm teaching and then learning and teaching and learning all the time. I did work in industry for a short while. I would have to say that was probably the most boring time of my life. Um, you know, I spent about seven years working for various different companies, including a big international bank, which is now completely bust. And um, that was very, very boring, you know. Um, I didn't learn anything during that time. Luckily enough, I got laid off in 2002, and then I got a master's degree and uh, got a lectureship, started teaching, and basically, I suppose, my brain started to engage again. I did a PhD 2009, uh, all about music information retrieval, and I made this amazing thing called TunePal. So this was like an idea that uh, I kind of like taken hold when I was an undergraduate student in Kevin Street. Uh, TunePal is a music information retrieval system for traditional Irish music. So it's used by every trad musician in the world now. Um, uh, let's see, like famous musicians, everybody learning trad music, we say in the last like 10 or 12 years uses this app. And every month around 60,000 music searches go through this app. So basically what it allows you to do is play a tune, and then it goes and uh, transcribes the tune and will give you basically the matching tune from like one of uh, 23,000 music scores drawn from loads of different archive collections. Now, this is very much for me a passion project. You know, I didn't need to be told to do this. Uh, I would compare my development of the algorithm of TunePal to um, 
you might have heard of a guy called uh, Bill Joy. Bill Joy was the chief sci- one of the chief scientists in Sun Microsystems. And he was also the guy who wrote things like the VI editor and various other tools for Linux and Unix. And he used to talk about staying up uh, for days. You know, he, 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 he compared his uh, coding to Michelangelo, who uh, there's a book called The Agony and the Ecstasy. And Michelangelo described how the sculpture was actually inside the stone. And all he was doing is like he had this responsibility to make the sculpture, you know, to take the sculpture out of the stone. And that's the way I felt about Tupac. You know, once I realized that this capability was there and that everyone would want to use it, I basically, uh, you know, like let fall into this project. And as it turns out, it was like, you know, it's it's something that's been really, really um, amazing in my life. Also, like very, very important to so many tribe musicians in the world. I teach on all levels of uh, coding. So I'm teaching from the Computing Academy, which is basically uh, TY students. Uh, so the game programming on the first year of the game design degree. And I think like what I'd say about that subject is that's like more creative coding. Um, I also teach OOP to second year computer science students. Uh, I teach game engines one, game engines two as well, which are two third year game design students, fourth year computer science students. They're quite advanced maths, physics, and coding uh, tools, you know, uh, for, for, for basically game developers, a computational approach to games. And then I also make loads of creative uh, projects myself, and we'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, infinite forms, deep, and loads of other amazing things. Um, and also making visuals and VR projects in my spare time. And all my stuff is on my Git repo. So tune pile visualization. Oh, you know what? Uh, I'm going to skip that for a minute just to show you. This is a project called Deep that I worked on. And this project is uh, I was teaching game development, uh, game design courses, using voids and so on. And I made this amazing project in collaboration with uh, two other people, Paul Owen Harris and Nikki Schmidt. And this is basically a, a, a meditation project. And this is a project we can brought to the Tribeca Film Festival. And we know all the famous people about to try it. And also, it's currently installed as a permanent installation in the Nemo Children's Museum in Amsterdam. Wherever you go there, you'll get to experience the deep machine. And the deep machine, you sit into it, it monitors your breathing, so it transports you into this like fantasy underwater world. I programmed all the creature behaviors in this experience. Uh, I've also been working for many years on this project called Infinite Forms, which is a 100% creative pro coding project. In other words, it's entirely art. There is no purpose to this project apart from uh, the pleasure of coding and, the, and, and like just having fun with, with, uh, with the Unity game engine. So uh, yeah, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's built in Unity. It's a generative world. It's procedurally generated and having with loads of different entities, creatures of all forms. Procedurally created and animated, and there's lots of archetype uh, artifacts in here as well, logos, various things. This is what the project looks like. I hope you guys can all see and hear me still. Um, this is just some examples of what Infinite Forms looks like. And I brought this project, you know, when I worked on it, I, I did a collaboration with some DJs in Dublin, and I used to basically program live visuals every month for this uh, party in Dublin called Paradiso Party. And basically, so I was going into my computer science classroom, teaching all this game stuff. And then on Friday evening, I was going out to uh, the Senate House in Dublin, staying up till three o'clock in the AM, in, in, AM, in the middle of the crowd with my Xbox controller, controlling all the visuals for everybody on the synchronized with the music. And so a really, really incredibly uh, fun project. Uh, and FYI, you can download all the source code of all of my projects on my Git repo, by the way, including this one. And uh, there's also a build of it on my on my itch as well, so you can download it. Now, what I did with this project, I think, is really really uh, cool because I had done this project, I had really gotten into a flow state, and I feel like I had learned so much about myself and about coding by developing this uh, creative project. Um, and so I started talking about the expressive power of code and like how motivating it is to be inside the digital world coding the digital world you know and how basically empowering that was and i i made this talk called exploring the psychedelic experience through virtual reality and it's based on this book called the psychedelic experience by uh, by timothy leary and he based that book on the tibetan book of the dead and then i kind of like found loads of different vr projects that fitted into different phases of psychedelic experience i brought this project then to a really cool festival called azora I also brought it to the um, Cologne International Film Festival as well. And I, I got to talk about it 
uh, there's a, a, a other thing called Republica in Berlin and so on as well. So, like, you know, this is just to, you know, put it all into context. All right. We're going to have a very quick uh, change of direction right now. Everybody ready? Uh, let me just check, make sure you're all still there. Anybody in the chat saying anything? Great, you're all still there. Wonderful, great. Industry-orientated education. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> Is that our purpose as lecturers, to prepare people from industry? How many people say yes or no? Just say in the chat. It depends. It depends. That's, okay. Mixed. It's not a yes or no answer. Uh, okay, cool. All right, very good. Excellent. Great. This is excellent. Socratic dialogue we're having here. Okay, well, I reject industry orientated education. Right? Uh, I'm saying this to basically make a point. It's not the worst thing, um, but you know, you can see I've drawn hats on these very cool women. They're all so professional looking. And I put a sword in that woman's hand. Why? Because I think, you know, as, as, as academics, as computer science lecturers, we have a, a greater responsibility ability to our students um you know let me talk about it right this is this is my philosophy for teaching uh first of all i think it's very important that we concern ourselves with the physical and emotional well-being of our students okay we're basically sending them off to work in this profession where they're going to be sitting at machines an awful long time they're probably going to be spending a lot of time in their heads thinking as as i do when i code uh, but also it's really important that they look after the physical health and their mental health and that they get into positive life practices early in this their career. You know, and this means being able to set boundaries with employers. I don't want to work crunch time. My physical health is important. I need to do my yoga. I need to meditate. Uh, and this way I feel they have the perfect balance, you know, because they've all of this head stuff, which is the computer science, but it is balanced with uh, a healthy lifestyle. This is really important for me in, in, in basically what I teach. The second thing I think we should be teaching is computational thinking. So computational thinking is one of the great um, intellectual disciplines that computer science has given the world, right? And this is the ability to analyze things in terms of data, processes, and structure, right? So once people, once people have those like core skills, they can transfer to any, every different platform. So that's why I don't think we should be necessarily focusing on one thing or another. They have to get the core skills and then they can go away and do whatever. The next thing I want is I want my students to be uninhibited and creative in their approach to computer science, right? Uh, uninhibited means that uh, they're not thinking, am I gonna get a mark for this? Is this uh, something that I'm doing in order to achieve like some extrinsic motivator? It should be intrinsically motivated, right? And they should be uninhibited, full of ideas, like like Elon Musk. You know, Elon Musk says, um, you know, when he discovered it, he was unique in this, like constantly thinking and, and and these constant flow of ideas into his head and constant creativity. I know not everybody's like that, but people can become more creative. One of the great ways is by becoming less inhibited, right? So your inner critic goes away, right? Everything is brilliant. Everything is welcome. Everything is free. I also I want to raise my students' consciousness. Uh, in other words, not just to think about themselves, not just to think about, oh, I'm doing this thing, I'm getting a job, uh, you know, to elevate their consciousness as they see their role in culture, in society, where their thoughts come from, and so on, right? I want them to know about their inner power, which basically means that they have the creative potential to achieve whatever, you know, it is so incredible right now, the actual power of a computer scientist, um, is, is almost unlimited. We have the power of gods. And I think we don't often realize that this is what we are giving our students. We're giving them the power of a thousand gods. Uh, we also have to balance it out with the whole big picture, you know? I want them to understand what flow is, what flow state is and how to get into it. And then how to work in teams, set boundaries, be respected and tolerant and be hippies. This is what my course is, I, I hope to, uh, to, uh, to talk about. I'm gonna skip the Terrence McKenna thing. That's just a little bit of a cognitive thing. This is all about flow state. I realize I'm about 20 minutes in here, so like, I am going to probably skip a few bits here. Uh, but the feeling of flow state is something that I achieve every week. And I think it is absolutely transcendently beautiful state where you feel at one in the digital world. You're coding. The ideas are coming. You implement the code. Next thing, there's an octopus swimming around you in virtual reality. You know what I mean? It's like so amazing, this feeling, right? Um, it's like a positive feedback loop. And I want my students to get into that because 
I think this is where they're going to learn the most, right? Uh, and it's also very joyful. This is what flow state kind of feels like, right? Learning programming is the same as uh, programming. Learning programming is the same as programming. Teaching programming is the same as learning programming. Programming is the same as learning programming. I actually think very strongly that like coding all your life regularly is a great way to stave off cognitive decline and Alzheimer's and things like that because it's a constant learning process and it's a constant process of growth. But anyway, let's move on. Next thing, yoga in the classroom. About 10 years ago, I started teaching yoga as part of my computer science courses. And um, why did I do this? Because I reflected on what my students' lifestyle choices. I reflected on what people in the industry were telling me about their kind of levels of uh, unhealthiness and so on. I said, OK, I want to do something about this. This is important to me. Uh, my mom taught me yoga when I was a kid. Uh, I've been doing yoga all my life. I do yoga every day. It's just part of my daily existence. And it brings you into your body, lets you become aware. The other thing as well, like all these issues that students have, maybe when they get older, but like bad backs and whatever. Man, just get into positive life practices straight away. And um, you know what? You don't have those problems as you get older because you're sitting in front of a machine all the time. You know, I say like code for 45 minutes, put a yoga mat beside your desk, do yoga. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and just do that because why? Because very important, very important that you do that. And I'd say this to you guys as well, go and learn yoga. I started doing this about 10 years ago and I was not trained as a yoga teacher. And uh, I just started doing this thing with my students. And over the years I've evolved it and grown it. And now I feel like I'm actually quite good at this yoga th thing. I have like hour long things, I can do 45 minutes, whatever. The one thing I would say about this, right, is that uh, this required balls okay uh you know uh, nobody as far as i knew was doing this ever also i'm not trained as a yoga teacher but i felt in myself that this was very important and my students knew about this this is wisdom and so i had a bit of like i say just i have balls everybody should have balls in the computer science classroom most importantly us we have to go in there and be prepared to fail be prepared to look stupid be prepared to have people laugh at us in the classroom and um, because that way we grow and you know what? Not every lecture is supposed to be like uh, earth shattering. You bring you just grow and learn by trial and error, you know? And so I kind of got better at this, you know? And now I get my students meditating in the class, which I think is amazing. And I can honestly tell every single one of you, right? Uh, I have a four hour class on a Monday. So it's a mixture of lab lectures, studio classroom style. We start the class most weeks by doing maybe 20 to 30 minutes of uh, yoga, Wim Hof breathing, meditation. We go up onto the, the roof of TU Dublin sometimes to do this. And honest to God, my students flow into the classroom afterwards. And the, the, the transformation and the learning experience is just, it's profound. You know, it's absolutely profound, right? So this is something I've been introducing uh, as well as the Wim Hof thing. So do these amazing uh, Wim Hof breathing exercises, very simple, three things, breathing, um, cold showers and mindset. All right. So I've been introducing a uh, Vim Hof and we do the thing. All right. So that's basically the first thing. The second thing I want to talk about is technique in the classroom. And, um, you know, like this, this is, this is about, you know, how we basically engage our students. The first thing I have in my head is I sat through many boring lectures. I I think when a person is bored in a classroom, they are not learning anything. So if your students are bored and you are bored, then you might as well just go and do something different. So here's what I do in the classroom. Yoga, number one thing. The next thing is Socratic dialogue, right? So I'm talking a lot today. This is, I don't normally talk. I normally question and everything is questioning. Why this is so interesting is like, this is not a new technique, of course. So Socrates came up with this two and a half thousand years ago in ancient Greece. It is a way of eliciting knowledge by asking questions. I'll give you an example of this in a minute. The next one is storytelling. So storytelling, we, you know, this is a thing that human beings do so well. Like, and we spot these connections, we do interesting things. I'm gonna give you guys a, a case study and an example in a minute of how this whole thing works together. The next thing is the 15 minute rule in the classroom. Every 15 minutes do something different. It's roughly the attention span. You know, it doesn't have to be exactly 15 minutes, but if things go like more than say a half an hour, or whatever, it's doing something different or radical, slapping the face with a wet fish, 
you know, say something different, code this thing, get off, walk around, then uh, there has to be some change every 15 minutes, half an hour. If you're doing like PowerPoint number 60 of PowerPoint 120 on hour number two, forget it. Go and do something else with your time, right? The next uh, lesson is ABC, always be coding. So my students are always coding in the classroom, you know? Uh, they bring laptops and uh, so on, and basically everyone's coding the whole time. And my exercise, I show them things, and then immediately, boom, do an exercise, do an example. Here's a problem, try this thing. Work in a team, introduce yourself. Next thing is open creative um, assignments that inspire curiosity. So there's no bank accounts, there's no ATM systems. Instead, my students do a team project. I'll show you again an example in a minute, where they take a piece of music and they have to basically do an art project around that piece of music. They manage all their code in a GitHub. So it's so amazing. You can see how the students are collaborating. They make a beautiful YouTube video at the end of it. We have a, a, a session in the class at the end of the year where the students show their work on the big screens now in the Grange Gorman campus. It's like, you know, last year I bought popcorn, brought popcorn and, and, and oh yeah, whatever. Some students spend months on these assignments, right? These are first year programming students. They spend months working on them and they're almost, I swear to God, I had students almost crying when they were doing their demos at the end of the year. They had spent so long on it. Now, I want you guys to think about this, right? Because this is very, very interesting, you know? When we talk about teaching programming, we talk about drill. We talk about students having to do loads of coding over a long period of time before they get good at it. Now, what has happened here with these creative open-ended assignments is I literally open the door and the students walk through the door and they do the work themselves. I don't have to motivate them extrinsically, right? The next thing is they're all based on music, arts, and maths. One thing, again, I found very, very good. This is from Sun Tzu, The Art of War. Uh, he who prepares wins. He who do doesn't prepare always loses. So I do lesson plans. And I'm going to show you examples of all of these things there in a minute. Let me see. These are the tools I use in my classroom. So Git, about 10 years ago, I started using this Git thing. Uh, everything I've written on a computer in the last 10 years is up on my Git repo. And I think, I often think if you want to know me, you can look at my commits on my Git repo because that's when I'm basically in my flow state, working, thinking about coding and so on. I use the processing thing, which I'll show you an example of, Visual Studio Code in Java. Unity, which is an amazing 3D game engine, which I'm slowly moving away from because it's kind of lost its uh, appeal in the last few years. Babylon.js is an amazing JavaScript framework that allows you to sort of like code VR apps, which run in the browser. There's no edit compile time. You're, you're straight from coding into the thing. And then Spotify, because uh, we want to get into the flow state. So we need really good playlists to listen to when we're coding to help us basically become one with the digital world, right? An example, 2D arrays. How many people think it's important for students to know how to iterate over a 2D array? Vital. Absolutely vital, right? And what do you do? Do you do a mate? Do, do you just like get them to do a Christmas tree or do you get them to do something? This is an example. I'm picking this as a case study, right? Because this is an example of two things. Number one, um, Socratic dialogue in, in my classes. And number two thing, which is, um, uh, what the, what's the number two thing? Socratic dialogue. And, oh yeah, storytelling. Here you go. Here's how I teach 2D arrays. <laughs> so we start our class with a Socratic dialogue about the origins of life, religion, the primordial soup. We ask, does God exist? I get my students, open the door here. We start talking, where do we come from? You know, are we machines? Are we just like chemicals, you know? Uh, or, are, or is there something more to life? And then I got all these students like throwing in opinions and stuff, right? Next of all, we watch an interview with John Conway. You might know about this thing. Uh, John Conway in 1970 uh, developed this thing called the game of life, right? It's a very simple little simulation of a biological system where cells can be born and die. This amazing thing that John Conway developed, when you code this up, and a first year programming student can code this thing up, right? You program these simple rules and life emerges from the simple rules. Next thing, you have creatures that give birth to other creatures. Things that look like primitive beating hearts evolve out of these simple rules. So um, this was a very formative um, example, which has influenced image processing, uh, biology, um, genetics, everything. It's a really cool example. Anyway, we watch an interview with him, maybe a little bit about Richard Dawkins. 
I show some videos of the game of life, and then we get into the uh, coding bits. And the coding bit, they make a class, they render the board, they have to write a function called count cells around. So the students are implementing all of this. They implement the rules of the game of life. And if at the end of it, an amazing thing happens, an amazing thing happens, and that is that the students' programs start to evolve by themselves and they get this amazing emergence. And what happens? Same thing that happens in a lot of my classes. The students are sitting there going, whoa, it's amazing. They're so incredible. And I conclude the class then by saying, ah, are we just, are we just a cellular automata? Is this universe just a great, a great, a great big uh, game of life? And I conclude with uh, my man, Alan Watts, and uh, a quote about the dream of life. You know, and it's basically all about how we are gods in human form. Now, that's an example of a Socratic dialogue. It's an example of storytelling in the classroom. And it's also an example of computational thinking, computer science, learning outcomes, right? And that, that's an example of, that's one example. That's a 2D array example that I would do with my first year students. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna switch out of the PowerPoint now, right? And uh, just to show you some of the tools, you guys can all see my screen, okay? These are the tools. These are the tools. Uh, where's the processing? If you're still there, just say if you're still there in the chat. If anybody's, if anybody's still there, if you're bored, you know, if you're, if you're happy. Are you happy? Uh, say if you're happy. happy. Very happy. 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 Great. Excellent. Love okay. it. This is the processing tool that I use, right? And I'm just going to show you a couple of little examples here. Um, this is, for example, now you might think, oh my goodness, this is like this is about week three or week four for people who have never seen a computer program before, right? And I teach them basically a little bit of trigonometry, a little bit of um, simple procedural drawing, you know, using line, circle, ellipse, and so on. They don't need to know about loops, but they know about variables. And then they're able to uh, come up with and construct an algorithm. Right, so this, this, is, this is a thing. I actually do an entire day workshop like for, for, for TY students called Spiral Jam, where they start out at the very beginning at the very end of the day, every student is able to make a beautiful piece of generative art. Oh my goodness, I don't know if I have any examples here, but um, they can get them printed up into t-shirts. And again, this is another like mind bomb for the students. You know, we talk about Fibonacci sequence, the Fibonacci in nature and so on. And then it's all connected into this program that they write. And the learning outcomes here, variables, trigonometry, maths, uh, understanding about how color works, right? So we do about RGB colors, HSB colors, and so on, right? Now to show you maybe something a little bit more advanced than this, let me see, where is this? This is my audio biz experiments. So I do loads of stuff with students about uh, how sound works. Sound is fascinating, vibrations, and it's so easy uh, to do signal, the basics of signal processing is really, really easy. Let me see audio visual experiments here, right? I'm just gonna run this program for you guys. Um, so, this is like the, the second semester assignment. The students are, um, you know, they have to pick a, pick, pick a piece of music. But these are just some of the example programs that we write together. Uh, these look beautiful. They are not very simple colors. Elements in the uh, in the code, and uh, there you go. So this is not complicated code, by the way. You guys are totally capable of, uh, of 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 understanding this, like you know, and writing this kind of code yourself, and then introducing these kind of like uh, types of exercises into the classroom. So that's processing. Really cool. It's based on the Java programming language. It was invented basically to teach artists how to code and programmers how to do art. And as you can see, it is Java. It has classes, inheritance, polymorphism, and so on. So literally any computer science concept you want to teach, algorithm design, everything, it's all in here. Uh, the other thing about this as well is it has all those lovely 2D line drawing, circle drawing stuff, you know, that I learned when I was a little boy and I found so engaging. And then students, again, when you when, when you engage with all this stuff, when you show them all this stuff, that's it. You don't have to teach them anymore. You know, they teach themselves. Uh, let's see. I wanted to show you maybe because like just a couple of things here. I had opened up my web browser here. First of all, this is, for example, you know, when I say I use Git and I use processing in Java, this processing thing also can be used through Visual Studio Code. So this is an example of processing sketches done through the Java framework, right? Uh, this is, you know, as I mentioned before, this, this is Conway's Game of Life. Maybe I'll just show you this. 
function F5. So this is running in Visual Studio Code. You have an interactive debugger here. Uh, you can teach all the Java command line stuff. You have this really cool little simulation of the biological system going on here. Let me see. I think I'm pressing different keys, but there's two clears. And you get these beautiful, uh, simple kind of, you know, amazingly, um, if you watch these, if you watch these little generative patterns for a while, eventually you'll see things evolve. You know, let me see if I can see one. And, uh, okay, there's a, there's what's called a walker just appearing. These little systems, you know, these little, these little complex little generative systems start to evolve. But you can also run it, like I say, through Visual Studio, uh, through Visual Studio Code. So if you want to teach, like, the Java thing, and you want to teach the IDE and all the rest of it, there you go. You have it all, right? Uh, okay, cool. I kind of wanted to just show you the general structure of a course. This is a general structure, for example, of, of a second year programming course. So week one, week two, they're making a game, right? So week two, you do, all you do variables, the if statement, they're already able to actually make a little simple game called Bulldog. And then we're up to all of this. This is how I teach loops, right? So these are amazing little uh, graphics problems. The students have to create this with code. So they write like a nested for loop. They're generating the colors with code and so on. These are very engaging. Students get totally lost in how to make these. Wow, you know, making the colors change and so on. Uh, these are loops, loops, more loops. You know, they're all based on these kind of, these are this using the process and framework, then arrays, they're, they're plotting data sets. You know, minimum, maximum, average. They can they can plot the data sets like this. this. Is a program I wrote the first year, and uh, then we're into audio. Oh, do we? Oh yeah, audio, digital audio. Week six in my OOP class, they're analyzing sound, and they're able to do these beautiful uh, visualizations of sound. And um, then there's a Conway's game of life. Their assignment, just to briefly show you this, you guys, the assignment looks like this. Uh, uh, I, you know what, I'm actually going to put a Git repo together, which I'll share with everybody afterwards, which is loads of little simple examples of different things. But their assignment is this, they fork a starter project, they have to pick a piece of music, so they can pick a pop song, piece of music that has meaning to them, and then they make a beautiful uh, art project out of it. Now, I wanted to just show you also that if you, and I'll share this with you guys as well, I don't have time to show you it all today, but I have years and years of playlists of these beautiful um, art projects, these beautiful creative projects that my students made. Um, I'll just show you very briefly, all code in here, all made from code, you know? These are first year programming students who have never programmed before. And by the end of the year, they're spending like three months working on this incredible art project that's entirely generated from code, all right? So this totally turns them onto code, in my opinion, right? Other things, I'm kind of like running, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of running out of time here, uh, which is all good. There's a couple of things I just want to um, like maybe show you one one last. I also teach a Unity thing as well, but I was going to show you one last interesting thing, right? Um, and then we'll go back to the PowerPoint point and we'll actually, we'll detonate that time, but we'll detonate that bomb that we actually launched earlier, right? So where are we here? This is my uh, Game Engines 1 course. For this year, by the way, the Git thing is incredible. Uh, every course I've taught in the last 10 years is on my Git repo. So you can go back to any week. For the last few years, everything is recorded as well, which is so cool. So I have the you know the links to the previous uh, links to the previous classes. This year I came up with a crazy idea for an assignment to get my students to make holograms because I was thinking a lot about vintage sci uh, vintage sci-fi. And I came up with this idea, right? I grew up in the 70s, 80s. And, uh, you know, watch things like the six million dollar man. Imagine like somebody like that suddenly arriving now and being able to like have the power of all this creativity, be able to create anything as a hologram. So I came up with this idea called the six million dollar man's lava lamp. And I spent a good few time, uh, some, some good crack in the classroom, you know, talking about 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, retro sci-fi, Star Trek and so on. And then actually watch this. This is this is good. I will share this. It has a. Uh, waging and it has a really detailed rubric, right? The rubric is based on grooviness, which is all to do with the aesthetic, complexity, how much work, how many Git commits they make, do they use solid principles? So this is serious computer science learning outcomes from this wacky idea, right? Expressed into this uh, lovely rubric that I put together, which I'm happy to share with everybody. Um, I just wanted to show you that. And I think I'm gonna wrap up pretty soon. Six million dollar man's lava lamp. 
It's time to, it's time to set off the mind bomb, you guys. I could show you loads more stuff, but um, I think we, we, we kind of got to finish up. It's time to let the mind bomb go. It's time to set off the mind bomb. What, do you remember what that said? Do you remember that sentence I like, I let you guys, I, I introduced you guys at the start of this um, little short talk. Do you remember the, the metaverse that can be named is not the metaverse. What does that mean? I don't want to throw out a meaning for that sentence there. And by the way, if you don't have one, it's cool. I asked this to about a hundred, maybe computer science students and nobody could really figure out what it meant. But it's actually not, well, it is complicated. And it's like Shrek's onion, you know, there's layers and layers. So throw into you the chat before we finish up. What do you think that sentence means? We can stay here all day. What do you think the metaverse that can be named is not the metaverse? What does that mean? Socratic dialogue, you guys. One great, ah, oh, amazing. Great job. Who said that? I bet it was Damien Gordon. My soulmate. Something, something like that, that um, if yeah. you can name it, it isn't it. Once you put a label on it, you're talking about the pointer and not the memory location. Yeah. Something like that. Amazing. That is very, very profound. Yes, very deep. Other people, but there's more. There's layers to the onion. And this is what I call a Socratic dialogue. Like, so an awful lot of teaching is like, you know, the filling the pail. Forget about filling the pail. Filling the pail is irrelevant. Light the fire. Move on from filling the pail. <laughs> Lighting the fire is about actually getting people to think for themselves, you know? So I'd like, I would like if anybody else in the chat wants to throw in, what do you think that sentence is about? And by the way, don't be afraid to do these sort of silly exercises, challenging things. Ask your students bizarre questions, you know, get them thinking. Uh, just come up. Uh, what do I call it? I call it a, um, a, a cognitive tangent. Cognitive tangents are great. You want to keep the students on their toes. So here's one for you guys. Excellent. Thanks, Marcus. As the limitations become defined, metaverse can be limitless. I hope you guys are all thinking. Is everybody thinking? Just say yes if you're thinking, even if you don't have the answer. And then I'll, I'll, I'll give you like a, a, an idea about what I think this phrase means. Yes, everyone's thinking. Great. That's the, that's it. I have achieved my goal, right? That is the goal. Here's the mind bomb. So I thought about this sentence, right? Uh, and it's, it's so interesting, right? Nobody could explain this sentence as well to me. And then I actually had a conversation with somebody last week. And the person basically described it exactly perfectly. So it's about basically, this is a dialogue I have, right? So um, that phrase, the metaverse, that can be not the name, is not the metaverse. So there's loads of buzz and hype around the metaverse right now. Uh, that's not the metaverse. That's the whole point of it. The metaverse is a concept which is constantly evolving and changing. It's the spirit realm. It's the DMT entities. It's the computers. It's 5G. It's VR headsets. It's everything. You know what I mean? So that's it. When you start putting labels on things, it's not the thing. OK, is there a deeper meaning? Yes, there is a deeper meaning. This is a reference to a book called the uh, Tao Te Ching, which was published in 500 BC, right, by a guy called Lao Tzu. Uh, Lao Tzu, I pronounced, uh, was, uh, was corrected by my Chinese friends. And uh, it's basically the foundations of Taoism. Uh, a lot of Chinese philosophy uh, comes from this. This is the layers of meaning. This is peeling back the layers, right? Uh, See this text you see on the screen? The most intelligent explanation for what that phrase means. And when I had this conversation, I truly felt I had met my soulmate and my true spiritual connection. This conversation was given to me by GPT-3 chat. <laughs> I hope you all guys can check out GPT chat because it is going to change teaching forever we are not going to be doing what we did uh, up until now why because you can write anything you basically have at your fingertips now an expert in every subject including computer science that can write programs better than anybody else that can write essays as good as any human being uh, that can write a novel that can write anything and just for the crack i'll show you this here this program here not this one, was a, a program written by ChatGPT3. The AI is here, you guys. 
that time when they talked about the singularity, when the AI finally, you have the big giant head that knows everything and that you can talk to it. It has finally come. All right. Now, uh, that's, oh my God, let's finish up here. Oh yeah, this is the deepest, deepest meaning so far, right? Um, you may have heard of Randy Polsch. Randy Polsch, the last lecture, loads of great lessons here. And here is the deepest meaning. Are you ready for this one? The Tao of lecturing is not to lecture. <laughs> and you, you should aspire to find ways not to lecture. So instead, what you want to do is open the door, let your students do the teaching themselves. And that's ultimately what that sentence is all about. And uh, I think I'm going to finish up there, you guys. There you go. That's the last mind bomb. All right, you guys. Thanks so much for listening to my talk. I will put a Git repo together with a lot of references, you know, and so on. So, so you guys can like follow up with some of these ideas. Uh, I hope that you will reflect on what you do as uh, academics and really take the responsibility very seriously and only teach your students the good stuff and don't waste time in the classroom. Thanks a million, Brian.